Good day, this is Patrick Ryan from the Saudi U.S. Relations Information Service, and we're bringing you another special edition of Focus KSA. We're uh, pleased to be joined by Professor Dave DeRoche from the Near East South Asia Center at the National Defense University, and he uh, comes to us uh, to provide his personal remarks, not those reflecting the position of the U.S. government. And uh, Professor uh, DeRoche, uh, as Susurus uh, followers know, has uh, been a frequent uh, panelist at Arab U.S. policymakers conferences, and if you go to susurus.com and look at our experts page, you'll find a long list of his bona fides and uh, interviews and other panel appearances and so forth that he's made at susurus.com. But today we're talking with uh, Professor DeRoche, uh, who comes to us from suburban Washington, D.C., uh, about the military invention in Yemen, Operation Decisive. Uh, storm, which was launched this week when Saudi Arabia led uh, coalition airstrikes against uh, targets in Yemen, uh, against the Houthi rebels that uh, have brought Yemen into another phase of crisis. Uh, Professor DeRoche, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, why don't you lead us off with some context and background about the military dynamics of uh, what's been happening in, in Yemen and Saudi Arabia this week. My pleasure, Pat. Um, as you know, Saudi Arabia has been involved in Yemen for a long time. Uh, they played a, a pretty important role in supporting the Royalist forces during the Civil War. But most notably in recent times, there was a short and uh, relatively uh, unsuccessful war uh, by the Saudis, military action directed against the Houthis in 2009. The Saudis have learned from the events of 2009. Instead of taking unilateral action, they built a multilateral coalition with GCC partners and some other regional stakeholders to include, surprisingly, Sudan. Uh, but most critically, the Saudis have uh, secured the active support of the United States, which, according to the National Security Council spokesperson, has agreed to coordinate on intelligence and logistics. And these are two key areas uh, for this. Um, the, the importance of the support, you, you can't really overestimate it. In 2009, the kingdom reportedly expended a lot of their stocks of precision-guided munitions, particularly you know, the, the uh, JDAM, um, which is a guidance system on a dumb bomb that allows it to target things accurately. And what we've seen in coalition operations, even with the European allies fighting in Libya in 2011, is that coalition air forces tend to blow through their stocks of precision guided munitions much more quickly than anticipated. And so um, with active American support, first in intelligence, which helps determine that the proper things are targeted, and secondly in replenishment both of spares for um, their F-15s, and of course the uh, British have said that they will be uh, supportive as well, which I imagine would indicate they'll support logistics on tornadoes if they're involved. Uh, and then replenishing that stock of precision guided munitions as well as spares. That's gonna, uh, that will help ensure that the Saudi air action is far, far more effective than it was in 2009. Now, initial press reports are that Saudi strikes were directed against the Houthi controlled uh, installations of the Yemeni Air Force and uh, surface terror missile batteries. The targets that would basically uh, have the ability to retaliate on Saudi soil and also that would uh, be able to affect the Saudi and indeed the Arab coalition ability to patrol over Yemen. Uh, this is in keeping with standard practice, standard NATO practice and standard Western practice. And of course, um, the Saudi uh, F-15 pilots are all trained by the United States, most of them in the United States. Uh, they're they're uh, far better. Uh, what, what this campaign shows so far is that the Saudi Air Force has learned from lessons of 2009 and gotten better. Um, so you want to destroy the enemy's ability to retaliate against your own bases, and then you want to impede his ability to keep you from flying over the country. Um, if operations continue, however, the effectiveness of an air-only operation decreases drastically over time because the enemy is adaptive, the Houthis will disperse their assets, uh, the high-value assets will have already been destroyed, and they'll locate, co-locate assets uh, in keeping with standard practice that we've seen from Hezbollah and other things, next to civilian targets, that um, the coalition, I think, will be hesitant or just loath to uh, destroy. So the coalition is going to find that unambiguous victories will become harder to achieve as an air campaign stretches out. So my hope is that um, the coalition will, um, having made its point, 
uh, offer up, you know, a brokered settlement along the lines of the proposed GCC settlement, and that these airstrikes will be coordinated with the political sol solution, which is the inevitable outcome. There's a lot of moving pieces in, in all of this, and uh, it's not just the airstrikes against the Houthis, but there's talk about uh, ground forces, uh, Saudi forces being mobilized. Uh, there are nations that have, have stepped up and promised to provide ground forces. The Egyptians, uh, Pakistanis, uh, some of those coalition partners you mentioned uh, are interested in contributing forces. Uh, there's uh, the, the Yemeni order of battle includes, I understand, uh, ballistic missiles. And I, I can recall that during a border skirmish with Eritrea, some of those were actually uh, launched across the Red Sea. Uh, and I'm not up to date on what their order of battle is, but uh, they also could pose a maritime interdiction threat being astride the Babel Mendev, the, uh, the choke point from the Red Sea to the, uh, the Gulf of Aden. Uh, the border with, uh, with Saudi Arabia is, is one area. There's the border with Oman. There's Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. There's now, uh, as we've seen in the mosque bombings, uh, the threat of uh, Daesh or uh, uh, ISIL, ISIS. ISIS. Uh, can you put in the context, uh, this is a very complicated uh, battleground that the Saudis are having to look at, and, uh, and the coalition partners, including the United States, if we're actively providing logistics support, uh, we could be, uh, the Houthis have vowed to strike back at their adversaries. So uh, give us some sense of the, the dynamics of, of what's happening in this new theater in just the last 48 hours. Okay, well, the only thing you said that I, that I might have to disagree with is, that the threat of the Sunni uh, terrorist group comes from Daesh or ISIS. It's actually uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is of great concern to us in the United States because they are the uh, Al Qaeda affiliate that's shown the greatest ability and affinity to attack the American homeland. They've launched a number of attacks. So that is of great concern to everybody in the West and particularly in the United States. Uh, as for the Yemeni order of battle, it's unclear to me, uh, and I, I just know what I read from the press. It's unclear to me how much of the apparatus of the Yemeni state has fallen into the hands of the Houthis. And it's unclear exactly what the role is of Ali Abdullah Saleh and his placement and loyalists in supporting the Houthis. I suspect it's more than is acknowledged, but probably less than is feared. So um, uh, this surface-to-surface -surface missile uh, capability, which actually was um, exposed to the world when a Spanish maritime force intercepted a North Korean ship, carrying missiles that were originally going to be impounded, and then it became apparent that they were destined for Yemen, which at the time was a member of the Global Coalition Against Terrorism, so the missiles were allowed to continue on in Yemen. Those require a lot of technical know-how, and so unless entire units or significant portions of units of the Yemeni Armed Forces have agreed to um, cooperate and subordinate themselves to the Houthis, that capability probably isn't ready to go. Uh, that capability is probably not deployable. But the Saudis, I think, are, are clever and smart. And they're concerned about their homeland. And, you know, even as far back as the 60s during the Civil War, you know, there were attacks by Egyptian forces, Yemeni forces allied with Egyptian forces, possibly even Soviet forces serving as surrogates for the Egyptian Yemenis on towns along the southern periphery of the Saudi coast. So um, I think that the Saudis, um, you know, they operate in an American... Uh, style doctrine that they modify for their own circumstances. And I think that with the reported large number of force deployments, I've heard the number of high as 150,000, they probably will have deployed some air, uh, surface air uh, assets. Uh, they have Patriot Pack 3, which is pretty much state of the art for terminal missile interception. And, uh, I, you know, that capability is mobile. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it were reported in the open source, which is all I read that, uh, you know, Patriot batteries, for example, have moved. Uh, Patriot's the gold standard for uh, point defense, and, uh, you know, you would expect that, you know, places like the Saudi base at Khamis Mushet would uh, uh, be considered a high-value target that the Saudis would deploy their assets. As for the other coalition partners, it remains unclear to me uh, what level of um, involvement and how much risk they're willing to take. So it's quite possible to me that some of these coalition partners would be willing to employ ground forces to protect the Saudi border from an incursion. Uh, it was reported in 2009 that both Moroccans and Jordanians were uh, operating in the mountains in Saudi Arabia against Houthis who had 
across the border. Um, but that's a very different thing from ground operations within Yemen itself. And even then, you have to differentiate between uh, forces that might be willing to, say, establish a perimeter around um, uh, the hinterland around Aden, which is where the rump Yemeni government seems to have relocated itself under uh, Hadi. Um, that's a different thing than, say, recapturing uh, Sana'a or recapturing or capturing Sada. Um, you know, those areas are mountainous, difficult terrain, convoluted lines of supply, uh, easily subject to uh, being uh, uh, ambushed. You know, the Egyptians uh, lost probably uh, in excess of 25,000 soldiers uh, fighting in that part of the world in the 60s. And I, I can't uh, imagine that um, there's a great desire to go into terrain that's that difficult. It, it seems far more likely to me that the Houthis uh, will find that their lines of supply are overextended, particularly if they're under aerial attack, and they'll retreat from areas where they're probably not very welcome, such as Taiz and possibly Sana'a, back to their homeland where they're supported by the population in the province of Sabda. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the implications of, of this activity for the Saudi Arabian defense establishment? They're already engaged with the coalition to fight ISIS. Uh, they've got border concerns in the north. Uh, it's a big country the size of uh, the United States east of uh, the Mississippi. Uh, what does this, uh, in effect, being all in in, uh, in Yemen do to the overall uh, picture, the defense and security picture for the Saudis? Well, I think this, if, if this goes well, I think this has the potential to be a defining moment, sort of a, a crucible forging the professionalism of the Saudi armed forces. Uh, you know, there's a new, young, very energetic, very forward-looking uh, Minister of Defense in the Saudi armed forces. He's um, quite a departure from uh, the minister in 2009. Uh, and I think that uh, this campaign could serve as the impetus for true modernization of the Saudi armed forces. Uh, in the past, unfortunately, um, a lot of people who come to do business with the Saudis are just there to sell them equipment. And, uh, you know, acquiring equipment, of course, is sort of the easy way. You know, it's, it's attractive to the Saudis. Uh, but really, equipment doesn't mean anything unless it's employed with proper doctrine, with trained forces, with forces who have a personnel system that ensures the best people get to the top. Um, you know, history is rife with examples. Uh, the French had more tanks than the Germans in 1940, but they didn't employ them properly. Um, what I hope we'll see here is a proper employment of Saudi forces in a truly effective way that shows a capacity. And I think the American willingness to be involved in intelligence which I would presume would mean in the targeting cycle, uh, will uh, enhance that, and that hopefully um, out of this operation, what we'll see is a more professional Saudi armed forces that are capable of conducting uh, sustained operations, um, you know, in support of, and again, this is only good if it's in support of a political goal. They're not going to be able to bomb the Houthis in a submission. Um, there has to be uh, some sort of a conciliatory process. And the GCC framework, I think, is is a pretty good one for that. Last question, and, and not last uh, because of least importance, but the U.S. Uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia, you know, we have uh, ups and downs in the overall relationship, but we've always had strong mill-to-mill -mill connections. Uh, we do face a period where many question American resolve in the Gulf, uh, this so-called grand bargain with Iran, uh, the American uh, footprint in, in the region is, uh, is questionable, and uh, what, what does this portend for the, the military relationship and, and for the overall relationship, especially since uh, the United States is very upfront in what it's providing, and, and uh, presumably there's, there's more than is being discussed in the press releases. Yeah. Um yeah, it's interesting. You know, the, the phrase intelligence and logistics, which is what the National Security Council spokeswoman said, that covers a range of things. And, and for example, one of the things that I always look for is air to air refueling, um, you know, which theoretically is logistics, I suppose. Um, uh, usually, you know, allies come to us, they want help with intelligence, uh, you know, acquisition targeting, uh, after battle surveillance, uh, resupply of precision guided munitions, air to air refueling, and lift. They don't need lift because, you know, they're operating out of Saudi Arabia, but the other ones are quite likely. But look, this is a good thing. 
I know the Saudi and, and the concern in other Gulf states as well that a grand bargain has to come at the expense of the American relationship with the Gulf Arabs. Uh, they feel that the United States is at best um, just amazingly naive and at worst is treacherous. The United States is going to swap Arab chess pieces for Persian chess pieces, but that's not really the case. Um, the United States has global interests, um, and I think that you know our relationship with the states of you know the Arab states of the Gulf will remain strong regardless of what happens with Iran. We're not going to. It's not a zero sum game. We can get better on both of them and stay strong. This current support for the United States is in keeping with um, the defense goals the United States has outlined globally, not just for the region, going back to the 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review, where the United States said that it wanted to focus on building partner capacity. So the idea is that the Saudi capacity, which includes you know American-provided and built aircraft, but also crews that are trained in American procedures, the Saudis do that. They do their heavy lifting there in their neighborhood to support their national security objectives. The United States provides the key enabling capabilities that the Saudis don't have for themselves. If this goes well, if this doesn't go off the rail, if it's not an extended campaign where you know we're just bombing things for the sake of bombing it, if, if the military objectives can be harnessed to a finite, obtainable political objective, which again, I feel has to be a brokered settlement, then this could be a very shining example for the future indeed, and a very good moment for the Saudi Armed Forces. Terrific. Dave, any last thoughts on the, on, on the situation in, in Yemen, what we should expect to see in coming days? Uh, uh, your, your take on, uh, on the overall conduct of the intervention and, and where it's going? Oh, you know, I, the, the reports I get are so sketchy. Um, you know, my fear is whenever you do aerial stuff, Eventually, there are going to be unpleasant photographs of uh, things happening to people that you don't want to kill. You know, even in the Kosovo campaign, with excellent targeting, total command of the sky, precision guided missions, the United States took out a corner of the Chinese embassy that happened to house their intelligence offices, uh, reporters, Chinese reporters. Um, these things are going to happen. You know, an aerial operation is an act of war, and war is unpleasant, and targets people who you don't want killed are going to be killed in war. So, uh, you know, my, my hope is that we do not rely, you know, the, the members of the coalition do not rely exclusively on the military aspects of power, but are simultaneously working a diplomatic initiative. Uh, and, uh, you know, if this is short, it will be successful. And as the campaign draws out, the utility of military force will not only become less effective, it could become counterproductive. Terrific. Professor Dave DeRoche uh, coming to us at, uh, uh, at a crucial time in understanding what's happening in Yemen, the military in intervention by Saudi Arabia. This has been uh, Focus KSA. You can find uh, this uh, transcript and more at sustras.com slash Focus KSA. Uh, Professor DeRoche, thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to talking with you again as, uh, as this whole campaign uh, plays itself out. Yeah, hopefully we'll talk when the peace is broken out. My pleasure, Pat. Okay, thanks. Again, uh, this is Focus KSA. Thank you all for joining us.